um, you know, the, the globalists totally hijacked the discussion on this to make people tech phobic, um, you know, and uh, it gets us with like the, uh, the Luddites. And mm -hmm. um, um, despite some interesting philosophical points about, you know, or the, the mythology of King Ludd, um, there's, there's nevertheless this problem of, um, of a cult of anti-technology. And it's, I mean, it's always what's being thrown at us all the time is the cult of technology and the science, the scientismists and the scientismists like are, you know, coming on and telling us things that are not true. Right. And so it's, it's sort of created the idea that technology inherently goes to the dystopia. Um, it creates this idea that anything that gets developed is like falls right into the plan of the, you know, great reset or something. So yeah. um, it, it seems that in terms of um, ideological trap, the great reset people have convinced a lot of potential resistance that they're winning when they're not. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's like you could see an arsonist burning down a village and what the objective is for the arsonist is to get the villagers to blame fire and forget about the arsonist with his intention to, you know, his metaphysical intentions that can't be seen with the eyes. You could see the, with the eyes the fire, you could feel the fire, you could be afraid of the fire, but to see an intention requires seeing with the mind's eye, which is what the oligarchy has worked hard to keep blinded so people are not used to seeing with their mind's eye which is why you get things like oh i don't believe i'm too smart to believe in conspiracy theories and it's like what they're saying is i don't believe what i don't believe in intentions you know they're they're invisible and abstract i believe in just effects like i believe in the effects of the intention but i don't believe you could know intention um that's bull that's complete bullshit uh all of human history is shaped by intentions for good or for bad you know good or bad conspiracies so the mistake we make is that when we just induce ourselves or we allow ourselves to be induced to see with our 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 sent our five senses we're stuck in a in a bit of a cage where we are easily we fall duped to believing that what we're told is fire is the cause of our problems or what we're told is science is science's fault and it's like no you got a satanic priesthood misusing the word science and trying to use whatever they can get up, get their, their hands on as far as technology to enslave their victims. And they call that science. And it's like, no, no, that that's slavery. That's, that's, that's satanic, but it's certainly not science. That's the misuse of science. If anything, um, science is something very different. It's designed to be the expression of human, I, the way I see it. And I, I think I'm, I'm, I've got some points on this. Uh, is is I think that science is the expression of humankind's communion with God. You know, it's the discovery of the laws of the universe. We didn't make the laws, right? The laws are made by a lawmaker. So to the degree that we willfully not only choose to discover the unknown and make eurekas, right, transforming our 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 minds and our souls from ignorance to of those truths to to knowledge of those truths, we have the universe rewards us with a greater power of action, right? When we when we discover the laws of error dynamics we now have a greater power to break those laws that would normally bind us if we were ignorant we can now fly with a plane we can build things that we couldn't otherwise right so we have more freedom um so the question of freedom and lawfulness which we're told is this unresolvable paradox that goes back to ancient times which will never resolve because you know duty is always uh destructive to your uh, desires to do whatever you want uh, it's like, no, it's, it, it is very resolvable. You can take joy and pleasure and have higher joys. And, you know, if you are obedient to laws willfully that you discover are true and you act accordingly. So the oligarchy, that's science to me. And, and the, the passing down of those truths, you know, wrapping them in symbolic language called math that can then improve as a language or deteriorate depending on whether we allow the ideas to be forgotten that were true, Right or whether we improve on, on, on those ideas, then the language evolves in a better, more self-perfecting way. And we can tune ourselves like an instrument to the universe's uh, melody, if you want to think about it that way, right? There's a certain harmony and creation in the atomic and the galactic levels. So that's human beings. I mean, it's it's. I think this question of tuning is a, is a useful idea because the oligarchy has been trying to 
get us into this kinetic way of thinking of ourselves as like particles, you know, within a system bouncing against each other with these invisible forces pushing and pulling us. Um, and all we have is like our, our will to power, right? That true freedom is just your ability to impose your will onto a system. And um, it's very Nietzschean. This is the sort of thing that animated all fascists. Um, it's very insecure as well, I think, um, because they don't understand creativity or they're afraid of creativity since it's something they don't already control. They only they can only control that what already exists. So they work very hard at, at cutting us off of those opportunities that we have to be to make creative leaps um, into new discoveries, big or small, right? That would then result in us being more unpredictable uh, to the oligarchy who wants to keep us in a, you know, <laughs> likened to particles moving, bouncing around in a, in a gas chamber or something, you know, you can control the, the, the contours of the gas chamber and each individual human is kind of like a particle of that gas. That's how they, they think of us. Um, <clears throat> and you can get everybody to atomize themselves if they just think about their personal hedonistic desires and don't think about the whole. So, you know, it's in defiance to, to the laws of nature. And I think, yeah, real science is something which brings us closer to God, not f further away from it. So if, if you're if you're falling further away from God <laughs> and you call it science, you're actually on something else. You, the, the name is being abused. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a whole fascinating subject by itself, man. I mean, maybe maybe we can um, close out our episode. You could um, actually conclude some more uh, thoughts on that and lead us out. I mean, this whole yeah. uh, science versus religion um false construct is like a product of the 19th century um you know religious thought and and philosophical and scientific thought um are all uh you know common in origin right yet um we've been led through this like sort of science versus religion debate since uh, the middle of the 19th century fuck yeah that did a lot of damage um yeah no i, I mean I, I think when you uh when you look at the the writings because there's two periods we're told one period grew grew naturally out of the other period in a very deterministic way, and it's called the Enlightenment. We're told that the the British empiricist Enlightenment grew organically out of the previous state, which was the the Renaissance period. You know, from the mid fourteenth century till like the mid fifteenth sixteenth uh, century, and it's like no, there is actually. Um, that's a sleight of hand that was done to us to to convince us of this fraud. That was never true. The actual uh, enlightenment was a epistemological warfare. It was an attack, a cultural attack, and a subversion of the process that actually gave rise to the, the previous Renaissance period. And Renaissance thinkers continued even during the so-called enlightenment, which we say is like this, we, we, we bind it by a time period, you know? as if everybody who lived in that time period is an enlightenment empiricist thinker. Part of the enlightenment was this idea that, you know, logic, the individual has power using just pure logic to disprove the belief in, uh, in God and, and religion. It's all, those are just artifacts of a previous, more ignorant age. And so logic, which is the effect of utilizing properly our senses that, um, and we can construct descriptive formulas of the processes of nature that disproves God. And so you had this, and this is people like, you know, Voltaire, all of these radical, what it, what it became the basis of hardcore nihilism. were all into this stuff. Often they were, they weren't just existential nihilists. Uh, they were also hardcore occultists too, because I think when you believe in this godless cold, um, view of the universe, and of human nature made in the image of this cold universe, with which means there's no soul, no justice, no truth, just will to power. You also tend to then become more mystical as well, because there are processes that occur in the universe, like the ordering of the golden section in nature and other things that you can't account for by your cold, a causal worldview, right? And you're like, well, the only thing that would account for these sorts of patterns and seeming causality is something totally occult and mystical, which is where I think you get these. You know, a lot of these characters tend to be high level, you know, they, they, they tend to be very susceptible to uh, Masonic types of of initiation into Rosicrucianism or later on different variants of Masonry, uh, which are super kooky shit. Like when you read some of this stuff, like the morals and dogma of, of Albert Pike, 
um i read i read a few of the later chapters and it's really kooky stuff that these people end up believing in about you know reconstructing solomon's temple as part of you know the bringing in of a of a new age uh anyway there's there, it gets weird and there's we, anyway that's a whole other side thing but point being is when you actually read the writings of people like a da vinci um and you look at the effects of his actions which a lot of people don't do they they just take like wikipedia entries about da vinci or they listen to some expert talking about da vinci who usually is a cambridge or you know scholar who hates da vinci but you actually just like look at what he what he was a part of what he wrote what he did he was making revolutionary breakthroughs in everything he gave his passion to because he loved truth more than his ego and he loved and he saw it as a communion to god was he a christian no he didn't consider himself like a conventional christian but he was certainly a deist who believed that there was a moral law in nature that we could uh, tap into and share with our fellow man that reverberates past our life. And he's very clear on that, as are many people in the Renaissance uh, process. And if you look at da Vinci, part of what he's doing politically is he's working with Machiavelli, right? He's the lead engineer of Florence and of Milan fighting the Venetians as part of the, the, the war of the League of Cambrai to destroy the, the pox of the Venetian oligarchy from the face of the earth in 1509. Um, which involved a coalition of a whole bunch of warring different kingdoms who all realized, wait a minute, why are we fighting each other for hundreds of years? The French versus the the British for the Hundred Years' War and the and all and the Spanish against the the Habsburgs and like why are we or the the Holy Roman Empire? Why are we all fighting each other when we're all all of the, our wars, our armies, we're all we're all getting money from the same Venetian bankers, which is the center of global finance for like eight hundred years before that. It's the center of world evil. Um, and they all realized, let's stop fighting each other and let's just destroy Venice. <laughs> and uh, da Vinci played a very important role. So did Machiavelli. So did Cesar Borgia and others. And it was it worked pretty well and, and it was subverted. But it was a, a wake up call for Venice that they needed to do a different thing. They needed a different technique and a different base of operations, which became more focused on the British Isles as their new host that the parasite would move to. And the technique became, well, if we can't destroy science directly, we can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, cause that's what they were trying to do with their more hardcore inquisitionary type of approach of just crushing, you know, things that, that disturb the status quo. Um, that's not working. So let's try to say we love science. We'll get close to it and then we'll control the interpretation of what science is. And we'll say, it's all about your senses and description. It's not about the moral effects of improving your powers of action in the universe that that responds to your ideas if they resonate to truth let's destroy that part of it right and i think that's the last thing i'll say on this is there's the idea of promethean the promethean idea of christianity is sort of like a dual use weapon it's very it's a very powerful idea which was at the heart of the renaissance there's this idea that man ma is made in the image of the creator and that we can participate so there's the imago viva day but there's also the imago uh, pace day that we can made we can participate in creation and that's lawful that idea um so we're made in the image of and we prove it by participating in the pro the, un the continuously unfolding process of creation now that sacredness of the individual is again like i said a bit of a dual use weapon because it has like the atom the power to do a lot of great good you see the um, the explosion of population growth of longevity and other things that happened after the renaissance when you look at these growth the population growth uh, trends huge explosion right and not just in, in quantity but again, again quality of life longevity uh, and that had everything to do with these metaphysical breakthroughs that and the idea of statecraft being shaped around the, the consent of the governed the, the idea of the inalienable rights of everybody as being sovereign so that's that's very strong but at the same time it lends itself to if not being tempered by wisdom it lends itself if devoid from wisdom to a high degree of arrogance of man becoming god Right, we replace God as the individual, and then the whole becomes something abstract, secondary that you can sacrifice for the sake of your hedonistic pleasures or whatever you think you personally want the world to be, which was at the heart of the the organ. Like that was at the heart of the corruption of the the Enlightenment, and everything that came out of the Enlightenment in terms of British political economy, Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, like all of these crap philosophers who all were um, imposing this this Enlightenment empiricist approach to science to human social organization that then justified the idea of the will to the of the 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 masters over the slaves the, that was what Malthus was was all about essentially how do you regulate population and keep the poor families underpopulated underdeveloped 
um, by the master class elite. Um, so this is what the British were trying to destroy with Ben Franklin and the American Revolution. The fact that Ben Franklin was a discoverer not only of electricity, but also invented hundreds of, of inventions for both rich and poor alike. That was tied to his ideas of political economy, of state-backed currency with the colonial script of 1729 all the way up to his refutation of Malthus. Before there was Malthus, he was refuting the, the depopulationists in his 1751 tract on population growth. And he was doing it by the understanding that it's through discoveries and inventions that we, we mediate our relationship to God and we overcome the limits to growth. And so Alexander Hamilton, who was a prodigy of, of Ben Franklin, advanced this idea that had gone back you know, to the times of, of Cardinal Mazarin and Colbert of, of France, who created the Peace of Westphalia for the basis of the modern nation state. They put into motion an idea of, of dirigism that Webster Tarplay and LaRouche talk about a lot of, you know, state back control for the purpose of developing the productive powers of labor. And that is not a mechanical, but it's a it's a sacred. It's it's really a religious idea. That's how we prove that we're made in God's creation so we can participate in it. We can make new discoveries that allows us to over, over always overcome the limits to growth, with, which other animals can't do. They just adapt to whatever, you know, ecosystems God creates. Um, we can make them make those ecosystems worse or better, depending on the wisdom or folly that we allow ourselves to be guided by. So anyway, that's that's where I think that things have got really gone awry. And the whole transhumanist, you know, neo-Darwinian thing, this sickness is, yeah, it's the most anti-science thing imaginable. It, 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 it forces us to adapt to limits, right? Like the new ethic of the of the great reset green agenda type thing is know your limits, you know, adapt to limits says the zookeepers of the human zoo that want us to, uh, you know, <laughs> eat bugs instead of meat. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I need to ask you, um, what's motivating you and what, what is your need to, uh, speak truth to power? What is, what, what compels you to, uh, dedicate most of the waking hours of most of your life to, um, uh, you know, communicating important information to people and developing uh, this resistance. It's the right thing to do, you know. Um, how, how, how can you not have uh, that desire when, when, you, when you think about, you know, you put yourself in the shoes of, of, of so many great people like Ben Franklin or Jesus or, or Socrates or Cicero, you know, like so many people were willing to die for something divine and beautiful and good and and uh knowing as well that that's ultimately our destiny right? right like we're created by by a good and loving creator um this that's that's a point i think that gives me a lot of steam that ultimately god's you know like i'm on god's side um anybody who who thinks in our our terms are in tune with that are are on god's side um so the oligarchy is ultimately uh, doomed in that sense, whether in our lifetimes or whether afterwards, it's ultimately the case. So the question is, do we want to devote the small amount of time that we're given since I'm going to die at some point, you know, we're all going to die. That's part of being human. We have a, a limited gift of, of time in, in the physical plane to do things. And so do we want to waste that time or do we want to be amplifiers for the, the general, uh, you know, like Martin Luther King said, right? The arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, I think that that's a powerful idea. So yeah, I'd, I'd rather be an instrument for justice and God's will than than to <laughs> than to defy that. That that doesn't seem to do. My soul won't benefit by the <laughs> by becoming healthier if if that's the case. Matt Eric, Canadian Patriot Review, Rising Tide Foundation. A lot of his articles appear on the Strategic Culture Foundation. He uh, posts all kinds of regular stuff. Find him everywhere. Uh, We'll put his links after this. I uh, just want to thank you. Will you come back? Hey, yeah, anytime. No, Joaquin, I love what you're doing, man. This is really interesting stuff. And you're uh, you're so generous with your time. I occasionally, you know, just pop on my phone and I, I listen to your your briefings and your your endurance and your ability to just like piece together uh, a very volatile situation and give it coherence is such a high value thing. You do what I can't do. Like I, I usually I have to just spend a lot of time obsessing over something and doing deep dives and I, I cannot follow world events. So if it wasn't for your your telegram channel and these briefings you're able to do, um, I'd be a lot more lost, man. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody who, who took the time to listen today and, and post questions.
Yeah, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, and yeah, I look forward to having you on again soon, man. Thanks for all your words and your time. Cool, man. Yeah, anytime. See ya. All right. Cheers. Well, uh, that's been uh, Matt Arrett. Again, that's um, he's uh, he does the Canadian Patriot Review, and he also uh, does the Rising Tide Foundation. He writes regularly on uh, subjects of uh, some of the, the deep history of the cabal. Uh, he's done a lot of research and um, piecing together or drawing conclusions from you know research which is out there. Uh, which is, you know, very high importance to be able to do to, you know, explain what's happening with research that maybe has been produced. And um, and this is uh, on the subject of, you know, all of these different societies that were involved and kind of where some of this um, these eugenics or the Malthusian Malthusianism comes from the the, the these theories of uh, population limitations. Um, why they've been promoting that agenda, um, how they influenced the the Western left with that, um, the you know the green eco movement, you know, kind of connecting it to anti consumerism and and uh, connecting it with sort of lifestyle uh, leftism. Um, so uh, it's a very interesting world that we live in. Um, I always rely on. Uh, Matt to help me understand it a little bit better. So I just want to thank him again for his time. He's been with us. Um, we will uh, see you guys tomorrow. Um, we don't have any scheduled guests or anything. I'm just we're just gonna. Um, I'll announce the the subjects later. I don't know if there'll be something to discuss with the uh, Ukraine or we'll um, get back into our uh, great reset stuff. All right, take care.